All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Joffrey Golzar, interventional cardiologist and endovascular specialist. If we could go to the second slide. And also the chief medical officer for uh, Avenger. So education is very important to us here at Avenger. And uh, over the years, as you guys know, over the year, we have conferences, medical conferences. And unfortunately, um, those are all discontinued for this year with the uh, current situation. So we decided to be able to bring the education to you guys and um, really talk uh, in several different uh, scenarios, uh, both case studies, didactic lectures over the next few months. And hopefully this will be beneficial, beneficial and helpful to you guys. Before I get started, I want to get a shout out to people in the background that have been really putting a lot of work into this and helping us put this together. Gabrielle Rubo with uh, Avenger, as well as Jeff Monroe, Kara Parker-Smith, and Erica, who have done a great job in, in uh, helping us put this together. Um, and from our standpoint today, what we're going to do is um, um, I'm going to do a few little introductions uh, from uh, uh, who's speaking, our, our esteemed lecturer, Dr. Tom Davis, and introduce him. Then he's going to go over a case study and talk about OCT-guided therapies, go through some conclusions, and then a Q&A session. Now, in terms of the Q&A session on Zoom, what you'll see on the bottom of your screen, there's two tabs. One says Q&A, and that's what you'll use for your questions throughout the talk. Now, you won't be able to actually um, uh, give these uh, questions through the lecture. We'll address all of the questions at the end, so feel free to uh, submit any questions that you have. If you have any technical issues, like you can't hear something or video isn't working for some reason, in that situation, use your chat function, and uh, you can talk to us directly at that time uh, for us to be able to answer any technical issues that you have. So our speaker today, uh, the esteemed Dr. Tom Davis, a great friend of mine, international expert in uh, peripheral arterial disease. He's been a mentor of mine. He taught me so much that I didn't know uh, with atherectomy as well as with OCT guidance. I remember one of the first uh, times as I, as I was trying to really learn OCT guided crossing, I, I called Tom and I was like, Tom, you know what? Just I need some uh, I need some motivation. I need some help. And you know, he kind of pushed me through this and really allowed me to uh, uh, kind of gave a lot of his expertise and truly a world renowned expert in OCT. And uh, he's out of Detroit. He uh, 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 runs a local ch uh, Love Your Limbs, uh, Save a Limb, Save a Life chapter. He's uh, closely involved with NCBH. Um, and uh, is really speaks around the world. So it's really an honor to have him here today and to launch off our inaugural webinar on um, our, our technology. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for that uh, overwhelming uh, introduction there. I, I didn't know this was me. I thought you were talking about somebody else. So, well, welcome everyone. Um, so I was telling Dr. Golzar, this is the ultimate in social distancing with, uh, with uh, doing these, uh, these uh, webinars and uh, usually having an audience in front of you. So we're, uh, today we're gonna talk about, um, uh, obviously, luminovascular technology. And just as an overview, this is our slide. Many of you have seen this slide before. Uh, really, the uh, going from left to right's the uh, least invasive treatment options with lifestyle and medical management, which really every patient should uh, have. Um, Lumivascular atherectomy, which uh, actually uh, allows the doctor to to see the remove the plaque, which we're going to be talking about. Angioplasty, uh, which does intimal disruption and and fracture of the plaque. Stenting, which is uh, again same thing with balloon angioplasty. And as we go further into increasingly invasive options with surgical bypass surgery, uh, which some patients uh, certainly is, is an option. Uh, and then uh, certainly amputation, which uh, we're trying to avoid on everybody or, or at least uh, minimize it to uh, partial amputation so people can still actually walk. So the challenges during uh, PAD treatment, and, and there's a couple of reasons why I actually got into uh, lumivascular atherectomy and atherectomy in general, because uh, I, I really do believe that restenosis uh, is impacted by the adventitia, the B, the B cells or whatever you want to call them in the adventitia, 
when you disrupt that, you really uh, cause restenosis. So uh, in this study, you can see 116 uh, uh, patients. If you look on the left side uh, where uh, they, they looked and saw if there was adventitia in, the, uh, in, in your cuts and versus no disruption of the adventitia, uh, you can see restenosis at one year. So if you had adventitia, uh, in your uh, uh, atherectomy, directional atherectomy treatment, you had a 97% uh, restenosis rate. Whereas if you didn't, uh, you had an 11%. And, and I remember Dr. Simpson telling me he could actually, because he looks at slides all day, every day. And I remember him telling me he could tell me exactly if a patient restenosed or not, just by looking at the tissue samples. Uh, and he was convinced of that. And, and I think this data that uh, shows that is very, very significant. Um, this is another one, uh, Definitive AR, which looked at uh, atherectomy uh, prior to DCB or DCB alone. And uh, you could see that if you did atherectomy uh, and you had less than 30% residual stenosis, uh, you had an 88% 12-month patency rate versus if you had greater than 30% residual restenosis. Uh, after atherectomy and, and then drug coated balloons, you had still a 68% uh, 12 month patency. So, really, atherectomy and appropriate atherectomy uh, is, is um, really beneficial for, for restenosis. And that's one of the Achilles' heel we've always had uh, when you look at intervention versus surgery is the really the, the restenosis and the durability of our procedures. And I, and I truly believe atherectomy. Uh, in conjunction with anything else does does improve that durability that we see. The other reason I got involved in this uh, with uh, lumen vascular was really the radiation exposure. And, and I truly believe this because I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a case that you, you're sitting there for three hours and you come out and you feel drained because, it, and I'm convinced it's the radiation I received during that whole case. But it, if you look at uh, interventional physicians, they have the highest radiation. Uh, uh, exposure per year in uh, the millisieverts uh, three, that's an interventional radiology physician. And if you look at compared to a nuclear plant worker, which you would think that uh, uh, would be, you know, a, a significant amount of radiation, they receive on the average 1.23 millisieverts exposure per year. So doing peripheral intervention, we do, uh, do obtain a lot of radiation. And and there's so many things that we do to try to prevent that, but I think lumivascular uh, uh, procedures markedly reduce that. Um, you can see OCT in uh, crossing uh, with, uh, there's a 98% reduction in uh, uh, radiation exposure because it lessens the time of crossing and you don't have to have your foot on the pedal. You can see where you're driving, you can see where you're going, uh, crossing the lesion. So you really don't have to have that uh, uh, radi uh, radiation exposure. Uh, and then treatment, uh, you know, there's a reduction, shown reduction in treatment uh, uh, times and uh, radiation when you use lumivascular uh, therapy uh, with atherectomy. And, the, and these uh, effects of radiation, if you see full-time uh, physicians who have done this, brain tumors, cataracts, blood cancers, skin cancers. You know, one thing we don't have on there is carotid stenosis. Um, you know, and these are left-sided typically. So uh, there really is a correlation between these uh, adverse uh, problems that we deal with. So this is uh, sort of uh, the three modalities that we use during intervention for, for imaging. Angiogram is the, uh, the tried and true. We've been using it for years. Uh, especially with digital subtraction in, in, for angiography. Um, it, it's an external view of the vessel. It's a two-dimensional view, unless you get orthogonal views, and, but, to, but you really have only a two-dimensional uh, visualization of it. The radiation exposure, obviously with it, and uh, you use it for both diagnosis, diagnosis and therapy. Um, for intravascular imaging, we've had ultrasound, and that's really had an uptick uh, in usage, uh, uh, really on interventional therapy, both coronary and peripheral. Um, it's got an internal view of the vessel. You, when, as you go uh, move uh, proximal distal, you get uh, uh, more of a 3D construction. 
Uh, there's no radiation, obviously, with it, but it's really for diagnosis only. Uh, there's really no interventional portion of it, and uh, it's very difficult to actually orientate with that to see what's left, what's right, what's superior, anterior. You really can't tell that by ultrasound. Um, on OCT, uh, you can see the image on the, the right. You can see the comparative uh, external elastic lamina. You can see the media and the intimate and internal elastic lamina comparatively. And it's, it's just, it, it's better visualization. There, there's really 10 times the uh, uh, visualization depth of these. And, uh, and, and uh, you can see better visualization of the different layers. I think it's pretty obvious as you look at it. And again, just like IVIS, you have no radiation, it's internal view, uh, and, uh, but this is for diagnosis and therapy now because um, of uh, lumovascular uh, treatment options that we have. So this is the scan study uh, looking at um, uh, 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 patients with, uh, with uh, comparative uh, IVIS versus uh, OCT at different uh, segments of the uh, vessels. And uh, what they found was they looked at um, uh, different modalities in terms of uh, stent, plaque, uh, layered structures, uh, calcifications. Uh, and what they showed was, was really that OCT, and this was really uh, non-inferior or guided, but you truly saw that it was superior looking at uh, really uh, plaque, uh, vascular stent structures, uh, and calcification in the uh, and certainly about equivalent to IVIS and other modalities. So it really does show that uh, OCT images are safe, effective, and, uh, and in my own mind, I think much more useful to look at once you get to understand it uh, versus IVIS. So this is OCT guided therapy, uh, real-time precision plaque, as you can see here. Uh, these are larger pictures and uh, to, to orientate you, uh, on the left picture, uh, the OCT uh, device is on the at about seven o'clock. The back of the catheter uh, is at one o'clock. So you see those sort of wings, those three uh, wings that's there um, on the uh, from uh, four o'clock till uh, nine o'clock or ten o'clock is where the cutter will be actually uh, uh, going in there. And you can see on the uh, right view. Again, the layers there that you can structure the uh, media uh, and uh, adventitia there, you can see a cut that's been done with the atherectomy device in there. And, and one of the things that uh, I think is the most important thing, if everyone tries to get, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's uh, calcified, what's uh, plaque, all these different things, I think if you simplify this down there uh, as you do this stuff. It's really the dark layered structures. If you see layered structures, the media, that's the thing that you really gotta uh, orientate yourself for. If you don't see them, you just rotate the catheter around till you do. If you don't see uh, that medial structure anywhere, you're sitting in plaque. Um, so adventitia and media are the two things that you really have to notice. And we'll see those on the, on the players playing of it. So this is the device you can see. Uh, this is where the blade is open. Uh, the uh, cutter uh, uh, is, uh, as it's pulled back, it, it advances and spins and you can use it as a cutter. The imaging light you can see right there, it's just a couple millimeters behind the cutter itself. And so it, 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 it does do a forward uh, look to it. And uh, then uh, again, on the far right's the uh, chamber where you uh, uh, will uh, pack the plaque. So this is the system itself in general. This light box on the left-hand side, uh, capital uh, portion of it. You can see the uh, window up there, uh, which is the screen that you're going to be looking at. The sled, which connects the light box to the Pantheris, and then the Pantheris uh, SV itself. So I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, we're going to show a challenging, I think, below the knee case that we did. Uh, this was my first case, actually. So that, that tells you the, uh, the uh, I think, how easy it is uh, if I'm confident enough to show my first case because uh, many times I've done first cases before and uh, I am not happy as the outcome. So this is um, a below the knee case, uh, TP trunk lesion, posterior tibial C, uh, CTO. Uh, this was actually, as I said, my first case. The patient previously had a uh, FEMPOP bypass, which had failed. Uh, there was a single vessel runoff uh, with a perineal vessel. The AT and PT were totally occluded, as you can see on this 
uh, picture on the left. Uh, there was a focal de novo uh, stenotic lesion in the TP trunk. Uh, you can see the arrows coming down there uh, are the, uh, I should say, the, the yellow dotted lines. I hope that's yellow. I'm colorblind. So. Um, but the yellow dotted lines coming down there should be where the posterior tibial should be coming down. And you can see certainly the dark perineal. And up top there, you can see where the anterior tibial was coming off, and it's totally occluded. Um, so it was a total of 200 centimeters uh, CTO lesion de novo, uh, moderate amount of calcium, which many of these patients have down below the knee, and a very complex morphology, as you'll see. Um, we successfully wired across the CTO, and then we were going to do the Pantheris uh, SV, and this was the uh, second case actually ever done. Um, and then we did adjunctive PTA with this. So you can see during the case, this is the wire, successful wiring of the posterior tibial as we've come down there. And uh, you can see actually we brought this down to the ankle, uh, down to the calcaneus area there. Uh, so we really treated the whole vessel as it comes down. And uh, we also ultimately end up treating that uh, uh, perineal aspect as well too. So <clears throat> this is sort of the stilled image. And then I'm gonna show you some moving images later on. Uh, this is the TP trunk lesion and posterior tibial CTO snapshots. Where, and just to orientate you, you see the uh, <clears throat> up at one o'clock, which is the media, and that's that layered structure. <coughs> Excuse me. And then over here at nine o'clock, you can see this is where the cutter is facing, uh, and you can see plaque, and you can see actually a, a, a sliver of calcium there that's really more closer to the media itself. Mm -hmm. And so that's, it just looks like an uh, empty lumen, essentially, with the calcium. And uh, you can see there's a necrotic core. It's a little bit, it's not quite as uh, uh, luministic as uh, calcium is. It's a little bit hazier, but it's got clearly defined areas there. And you can see the plaque there as well, too. The cutter is actually pointing at 3 o'clock here. Um, so again, uh, there's the fibrous plaque. Uh, uh, let me see if this is the one that plays. Nope. Uh, so you can see fibrous plaque pointing at uh, nine o'clock. And uh, now we have the cutter on the right side pointing at about one o'clock. Again, you can see the media uh, and uh, it, very, very clearly defined as well as the adventitia. So I'm gonna go through the uh, live playing and, and we're gonna play this loop a couple times because I just wanna orientate you actually through the first one. And then as you look through the second one, I think you can hopefully start to pick up the, uh, the structures that we're looking in. What I want you to pay attention is really that the, the media and the uh, adventitia because those are the two things that you don't wanna cut. So if you know it's not media, you know it's not adventitia, you're pretty doggone safe to cut it. So the cutters, as I'm rotating around here, as you can see, the cutter really is now at one o'clock down to six o'clock. So it's rotating up. And you can see the media layer there as it's going there in the external last lamina. Now we're pushing the cutter down. And you can see I'm right up against the media there. We rotate to where plaque is. As we keep on advancing the catheter, you can see that it's actually cutting there. When you see the uh, picture go away, that's when the cutter is actually closed and we're packing. So again, you can see every small, small areas that are calcified. And that, but more importantly, look at the media. See how thin it is here uh, when we get out here. And again, this is all plaque. So now we're gonna run it through. I think you can get a, the media and the external lamina there. You can see the media as I'm rotating around because I'm truly trying to find out where the plaque is. And I wanna get the best, uh, depth of plaque that I'm going to cut towards. Um, and again, you can see the media very clearly there. I rotate away from it. I know it's plaque and I'm going to uh, advance. And as I, when I, after I've cut for a little bit, I close, close the uh, cutter so it'll pack everything in there. So again, you can see this is all plaque. One thing you have to watch for uh, is as you're going through this, you got to go slow down below the knee because the media comes up awful quick. And in some places, the media is almost obliterated by the disease. So this is going to be the TP trunk lesion and posterior tibial. Again, OCT image and loop. And this is going to be a medial cut up to the adventitia. So uh, I think you can see uh, that we went a little bit too deep. 
So you can see the media there, that uh, that uh, uh, Lanier, uh, Lanier area there. And you can see the wisps of Aventitia. Uh, it, it almost looks like uh, uh, small wisps of cotton ball or something to that degree. You can see it way out there. And then, so there's the plaque, there's the media. As we're rotating around, this vessel's gotten really, has gotten small here. But you can see the clear wispiness of the uh, Aventitia up top. As we go in, now we've cut right into the media and we've gone right up to the Aventitia right there. So I think you can see that. So uh, Dr. Golzar, I think, uh, reminded me I did that right after I did it. Uh, so again, you can see the Aventitia very clearly there. And so those are the two things that you really got to concentrate on when you're doing this. Again, we'll walk through it again one more time. You can see the plaque, you can see the layered structure media, and then you can see the uh, Aventitia, that wispy area out there with the bright aspect of it. Okay, we'll play it one more time here as it's going down here. We're, we're, again, best thing to do is rotate it around so you can look at what you're seeing because um, you're only going to have that 80 degree, 90 degree window that you're going to see. So you really want to be looking at uh, everything around there. So you really need to turn this device around a little bit counterclockwise and clockwise to, to get a feel of what everything is. Again, you can see the Aventitia up there. We took a, a deeper cut than we wanted to. So this is the, on the left, the pre, you can see again that picture where we had the TP trunk and the disease and the posterior tibial totally occluded. Now you can see the uh, perineal artery a little bit better. You can see the, uh, uh, the posterior tibial coming down. On the right, you can see the, again the pre, the posterior tibial where it should be coming down the perineal. And again, post, I think you can see the po uh, posterior tibial and the perineal very nicely. So, and again, the, uh, we, we did uh, post balloon angioplasty on this, but the results actually look pretty doggone good just with atherectomy. And I think you'll find that below the knee. Uh, once you do that, uh, you're going to see that um, in many cases, you don't really have to balloon. Uh, you'll be surprised how, how good it looks. So TP trunk lesion, posterior tibial CTO takeaways that uh, I would want to give you. Um, certainly this device is safe and effective. And again, you can see what you're cutting. And, if, and I always go back to uh, non-imaging uh, uh, atherectomy devices. I have no idea how deep I'm cutting. And uh, if my wire sometimes is subaventitial uh, uh, within the media, you know, I, I have no idea if I'm cutting into anything. And so I think it's nice to be able to see that, especially below the knee, because uh, perforations can occur down there and they can be uh, more problematic than uh, what happens in the SFA. Um, you got to be prepared for multiple plaque morphologies. Uh, but as I said, keep it simple. Know what adventitia, know what media is, rotate that catheter around in a 360 degree clockwise and counterclockwise so you really get a feel for for what's going on there uh totally in the vessel so you can really image the uh the the media uh in that sense um severe calcium uh, a dry run with a cutter because uh if you're getting stuck with that cutter the cutter can uh be pushed in you can cause perforations much easier so you keep the cutter closed you pass the catheter down there as a dry run to make sure it'll go uh if that if the cutter does if the catheter does not go um you may want to consider uh pre-dilating with just an undersized balloon a 2-0 or a 2-5 in the tibial and uh pre-dilate that vessel so then you can go back and then again do your dry run again as long as it goes down there uh, then you can come back and, and uh, image and cut at the same time. And uh, again, OCT guidance, uh, you avoid deep tissue atherectomy. Again, we went right up into uh, almost to the Aventitia on there, and you can see it very clearly. And that's, again, that's one of my first uh, cases. So uh, what I learned on this was I was going a little bit too fast because the media just comes up awful quick on you. So if you go slow, if you go slow, <clears throat> you tend not to have that problem, and you can uh, avoid cutting in the adventitia and certainly avoid perforations in that sense. So questions? Thank you so much, Tom. That's a great presentation, um, excellent case that you presented. You know, 
uh, as I've uh, done the, some of these cases as well and seen uh, a, a significant amount of cases, you know, we've learned so much with the Panthers SV device because it was the first time that we were able to use OCT below the knee because mm -hmm. really there's no data out there for below the knee OCT. And as you know, you've, you and I have talked about this, the morphology is so different below the knee. So, you know, what people don't realize is that what we're seeing is below the knee with OCT, there's a significant amount of destruction of the media. So, you know, we saw these beautiful images of the media and EEL. Below the knee, it's almost a game changer because sometimes we don't see the media, we don't see EEL, and so that weakens that vessel wall. Mm -hmm. and so, kind of, uh, kind of completing the loop and what you were talking about, safety and efficacy, that safety with traditional directional atherectomy, you know, usually what we do is we just kind of put it down there once or twice, we clean it out, and then we're kind of intimidated to go any further because we don't really know what we're cutting. And this is kind of proof is in the pudding, can then you realize what you, how close you are to disaster, how close you are to perforation or uh, disrupting that adventitia from the safety standpoint. And then with the definitive AR from an efficacy standpoint, you have that confidence to say, you know what, I can cut a little bit more over here. I can remove some more plaque over here because you can see exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I know we have a few questions up. Um, can we uh, get those questions? I think I can click on that. So uh, it, the first question was uh, from Gary Fishbein, Dr. Fishbein. He says, it's a long way down in the ankle. Was this an anti-grade stick? Uh, no, this was not an anti-grade stick. Uh, it was a shorter patient. Yeah, yeah. So, but we actually made it down there to the ankle. That was, that was actually as far as we could make it uh, with that device. So. Um, 140 is a length and then and, and up and over uh, again with a shorter patient you can make it down there yeah uh, and then dr. Raj Patel asks is primary benefit avoidance of immediate complications and restenosis um, I think so uh, I think there's <clears throat> there's data out there that shows that uh, not not mainly the media but I think adventitial disruption is more important uh, and certainly uh, staying out of the media or up to the media, I think, uh, limits your restenosis. I think we've seen that in smaller subset studies. The next question is by uh, Dr. S uh, Dixon Santanum. He asked, could you comment, so two questions, can you comment on the sheath or the guiding catheter that you used and the size? Okay. Uh, well, the, the size, of the sheath that you need to use for this is a six French. <clears throat> and uh, it's usually a 55 centimeter. I think we probably use a cook uh, sheath for up and over uh, in this case. And what type of wire did you use? Um, any Almost any 014 wire. I think uh, I had a regalia wire on this one, to be honest with you, because uh, hmm. that's usually a, a go-to wire that I have. So it was but almost any 014 wire you can use with this device. Yeah, I usually like uh, something that's moderate supportive wires, like a V14 or like you said, Regalia, yeah. be fine. And then he also asked, you mentioned the use of stents in the tibials. Isn't this the purpose of staying away from stents in the tibials? And if they are, do you use it in rescue cases? And what size would you use? Well, um, again, I think we, we had, uh, it, when we stented, it was just more of the tibial uh, uh, TP trunk. Um, and, and I really do spot stent down there uh, in that sense. Um, and again, it depends upon the size of the vessel. One of the nice things about the OCT, you get an idea how big the vessel is, uh, uh, especially the proximal area. So it's usually anywhere between a, a 3.5 and a 4 uh, stent that I'm using because it's more proximal. Um, but, uh, you know, distally, I'm sure people, people have stented distally as well, too. They're much smaller vessels. but uh, it's usually a three, five, or four zero that I'm using. And then uh, Dr. Santana asks a follow-up question: uh, Have you used this in, in a retrograde manner? Um, I have not personally. Um, again, you need a six French sheath. So if you if you have a six French sheath, you could certainly do it. Um, uh, wouldn't be that hard to do it that way. And uh, Dr. Patel asks a follow-up question. Uh, how often do you end up putting a stent in after OCT guided directional atherectomy? Um, and which are the below the knee stents available and cost, which, you know, the cost can be very Well, um, again, uh, there's certainly, uh, it's not common that I stent 
uh, after uh, OCT atherectomy. In fact, I, I'd say it's pretty rare. Um, there's really not any, uh, you know, right now you have tack below the knee that's available uh, that, that is uh, a stent. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't have the uh, radial force. It's more for tacking down to sections. Um, and I would probably use that more often than, than not, especially after atherectomy. If I had a dissection uh, after ballooning it after atherectomy, I wouldn't hesitate to do a tack. I would not use a, a stent at that point. Um, <clears throat> and drug-coated stent, uh, stents, uh, I would uh, probably uh, use that in limb salvage where I had somebody that had re a couple times. Um, I'd use it in those settings, but you know, though, those are probably the only settings I do, but I don't stent that much below the knee because, because I do do atherectomy so much. Um, and then Dr. Tedder is on, uh, Barry Tedder. He asked, uh, with multiple rotations of the device, this is an important question. Uh, all, all of these questions are really phenomenal questions, but this is also something important and a technical tip. And this is something that we really have to know. It's really any directional atherect, any directional device uh, with the short uh, monorail. This this is an issue. So you know, he asked about uh, pushing through d uh, discrete superficial re lesions and coming out multiple cuts. Do you have wire wrap, and how do you deal with that? Well, I, I first off. Um, you try to avoid it by not clocking or counterclocking the device too many times. Um, if you're clocking one time, you want to try to remember to counterclockwise back. So the less turns in one direction, you're going to avoid wrap. Uh, sometimes when you're doing these things, again, you know, did I clockwise, counterclockwise, you're doing it so much, you might forget. One, one thing I would tell you for sure is if your sheath, if you're going up and over, um, if the sheath is in the common femoral or external iliac, when you're pulling out, you've got a lot of tension on the wire and the wire will tend to uh, kink up at the sheath itself. So I think it's really important to have the sheath down into the SFA because it's a smaller vessel than the common femoral and iliac certainly, and you have less chance of that wire kinking up at the sheath when you're bringing the device back. Um, the second thing is, is uh, when you're coming back, if you act, if you feel any resistance at all coming back, you have to assume it's wire wrap. And the first thing you should do is then look at your sheath, the tip of your sheath and where the device is. Um, a lot of times you can see that wire <clears throat> in that sense. Um, sometimes it's just pulling back on the wire to release some of the tension. Uh, sometime it's, sometimes you can um, actually if your sheath's not all the way in, you can advance the sheath over the device and wire, because once you get the wire and the catheter inside the sheath, the wire wrap becomes less of a problem, because then you won't, you won't uh, bend that wire, you won't put a kink in that wire, and then you just have to take it out and then just, uh, you know, be care you know, as you pull the catheter out, unwrap the, the wire, you know, slowly coming out, unwrapping it. And that's probably the easiest thing. But, but I, I think that's the key to it, is really making sure your sheath is, is into the SFA if you can, and uh, if you feel any any resistance at all, I mean just the slightest resistance, you stop, and then you you look and assess. Yeah, no, really good point, and that's so important. The way I teach it for my fellows as well is just you know holding the wire when you're done, hold the wire in place, pull the device back until you feel resistance. That's going to be that spot where you have the wrap, and then just easily just unwrap it as you. As you pull it out, and that's that's the case as I mentioned with any directional atherectomy device that has a monorail system to it. So that's an important tip to use because sometimes you just get super excited. You're done with the case, or someone else is doing it. They pull it out and pull it against resistance, and that's where you have prolapse. So that's really important. And, um, and, and again, I think the biggest thing is is you can kink the wire at that point. At that point in time, you almost have to take the device and the wire out. The benefit of it is if you've done atherectomy of this vessel. You've already seen if you if you're pretty confident you're not up against into the adventitia, um, it's really not a problem pushing a wire back down there again, and mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about a perforation. You don't have to do so. I think if you do the atherectomy right, and uh, even if you end up having a bent wire there, kinked wire there, uh, pull everything out. Pull the wire out first, I think, because um, <clears throat> the kinks in front of it, and if you pull that kinked area into the sheath 
then um, then the the atherectomy device will come back much easier. Yeah, and, the, uh, and that's another tip, and a really good tip, which is what I use is uh, sometimes if I do get into that situation, I accidentally pulled it too fast, is push everything down and then look at it on fluoro. You can usually see that wire wrap on fluoro and then the kink wire, and then you can kind of untorque everything on fluoro, and then you'll kind of untorque it enough in the body instead of, you know, close to the sheath at that point, and then you can usually, it gives way mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to deal with that wire wrap. But it's really, you know, uh, something that uh, you have to train to and kind of understand. It's really not that big of a deal as you know. When we do it day to day, you know, you get wire wrap all, almost all the time when you do directional atherectomy, mm -hmm. just knowing how to um, address it. And yeah, I think you, get it, you get it more often in the uh, superficial femoral artery and popliteal artery because you're making quite a few more cuts <clears throat> and more rotations. I think below the knee, you're not rotating it as much. Um, so you, I don't think you get as much wire wrap below the knee. Um, and then uh, we had a question, another question from Gary Fishbein. In an anterior tibial artery, is there an angulation beyond which you are uncomfortable using the SV device? Um, I would say in an angled area like that, again, you really want to make sure you do a dry run with a cutter closed. Um, because if you, if you uh, don't, um, then you could cause a perforation there. Uh, if, it, if there's any obstruction, because as you're going through that uh, uh, curve there, uh, again, your cutter could cut, uh, again, that's again, any directional atherectomy device. So uh, I'm less concerned, a 90 degree uh, bend, I'm not as concerned if I can push the uh, device through all the way past it, and then I can come back, and, uh, and then uh, I feel safe, much safer to, uh, to cut there. And, uh, you know, and that's obviously the advantage of having imaging because you know exactly what you're doing. So, you know, traditionally, if you're, if you're using non-imaging atherectomy, you're sort of, you have to have the techniques of, you know, cutting away from the angle and doing that first. But here, you know exactly what you're cutting because you can visualize it. But uh, kind of to kind of build on what you were saying, also using a stiff wire, stiff shafted wire will kind of straighten out that bend a little bit. So a grand slam uh, okay. would help. That's the problem with any uh, atherectomy device, rotational too, as well. You know, we've we've had, um, you know, you have that wire bias there, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you created this trough into yeah. the uh, close to the adventitia, and uh, and that's a problem too. Um, so I, I I think the benefit I, I would prefer to do actually uh, directional atherectomy in those that situation just because if I know I can pass the device um, and I can see where I'm cutting, I know I can get away with a better result and less chance of a complication than if I have wire bias and, and putting any other atherectomy device in there. Um, George Batar asked, uh, if you find yourself subintimal in cases with the chronic total occlusion, now what? Well, again, nice thing. I, I think you can see, uh, especially below the knee, it's smaller. Uh, you're, you're obviously within the media itself at that point in time. As you rotate around, you're just going to see media all the way around. And you just got to see where the adventitia is. And you can cut away from that and cut into the media towards the lumen itself. Uh, and you can actually see, if you're not too deep in the media, you can actually see the lumen on the other side of the media. Um, so I think this actually makes it a lot safer to mm -hmm. cut there if you need to. Um, because you know where the adventitia is, um, especially in the uh, SFA, um, because you know you have to make a bigger lumen itself there. And uh, if you can cut towards the uh, lumen itself, you're going to have a lot better uh, outcome than cutting towards the adventitia again, where you have perforation. So I think uh, the the OCT aspect of this uh, makes that a heck of a lot safer. Yeah, absolutely. What about uh, using um, IBIS and OT OCT for renal patients? Uh, if for OCT itself or uh, as a diagnostic tool? I guess uh, the question came from Dr. Oh, Rajan oh. in terms of minimal dye use. I guess the advantage. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I was thinking renal arteries, but now I get it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the COVID in me. Sure. Uh, <laughs> advantage of, of that. You always everything at COVID, can't you now? <laughs> you can blame uh, it. You know, we've done a lot, you know, the nice thing about it is in the peripherals, you can use CO2 as well. Um, so there's many cases that, you know, below the knee, 
even though there's a lot of people, Craig Walker claims that you can see great below the knee with, with uh, CO2, but I, I still have a problem. So in many cases, um, if I have a renal patient, creatinine of three, three and a half, uh, I'll use a combination of CO2 and alternative imaging, uh, whether it be IVUS or CO2, uh, especially below the knee. Um, we've done many cases that are with absolutely no contrast whatsoever in that setting. Um, so I think, you know, that's where you have to use combination therapy. And I really do think CO2 in that sense uh, is helpful along with, uh, you know, either IVUS or CO2 or OCT. Uh, we have a, a comment and question from Dr. I think this is Montero Baker, the illustrious Dr. Baker from Houston. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, great job, guys. We're excited to start using this technology in Houston. There's some data in the femoral popliteal segments that relates to deep cuts to uh, relates deep cuts to restenosis. Given our enthusiasm with tibial imaging, image guided atherectomy, is there any such data showing high restenosis rates in BTK deep cuts? I don't think we have anything at that point at this point in time. I haven't seen anything. Um, you know, again, I think as as you've said, Chopper, we're still learning with this. Um, so I don't think we have a retrospective analysis of uh, that. Certainly we don't have a prospective, but it would be something that would be interesting to look at now, now that we have sort of a, a, a little bit of a data set. Yeah. So as you know, we are initiating the image BTK study, which is OCT guided pan, uh, atherectomy for below the knee and looking specifically at uh, safety as well as outcomes uh, out to one year. So that's going to be pending. So it's going to really be interesting to to see what we see. Uh, you know, well, the I, I think what would answer. I think what would help that is if we actually looked at the tissue samples too, like mm -hmm. like we've done in the SFA, uh, looking to see if there was any adventitia in that sample, um, and that would very much help because you can see the difference uh, in, in um, I think it was Prax uh, 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 series that he did that. I mean, it was a dramatic thing, 90, 90 plus percent restenosis if you had adventitia, you know, in the uh, close to 10% if you didn't. So I think looking at the actual tissue would be much more of a stronger, uh, uh, stronger. So that may be something we can look at doing. Yeah. And as we know, there is such high restenosis rates below the knee anyway. So, you know, our ability to improve incremental benefits it's so tremendous for below the knee, not only for CLI patients, but even quadricants, uh, you know, if we could improve our patency. And so if you think, you know, smaller vessels, higher risk of adventitial injury, as we've seen very clearly uh, when we do these BTK cases now that we have imaging, that it's so easy to damage the media as well as adventitia. And it happens probably pretty frequently. So hopefully, you know, again, this theoretical, but hopefully the data will, will pan out and show that we can improve patency by only removing plaque and not da damaging adventitia or media, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Fishbein asks, uh, in a case of long segment treatment, how many passes do you do and how often do you clean out the cutter? Um, again, depends upon if it's SFA or uh, tibials. Um, on tibials, uh, I would probably, you know, you get a feel for how, how, how packed you are. Uh, so in, in tibials, uh, usually you'll have to pull it out after one pass, I think, on, and if you have a long segment. Because um, certainly if you overpack that, that's where you're going to run into problems of distal embolization. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, after one pass, it's usually a pretty good on a long segment uh, to pull it out, empty it, and go back in. Um, on the SFA, again, you get a better, I think you get a better feel uh, of the uh, cutter being full. Um, long segments, I'll sometimes clean it out two, three, and maybe four times uh, to, to get a, a good lumen uh, in that sense. So it, it varies. It depends upon the uh, bulk of the plaque, uh, you know, how much plaque you're actually cleaning out. So, but yeah, I, I frequently clean it on long lesions. Yeah. And you probably see we get less plaque out than traditional atherectomy because you're kind of doing that targeted therapy. So you know all you're taking out is plaque 
versus usually you're just kind of going up and down and up and down. Yep. And usually that's what we do. And you're kind of taking out everything. When you actually see that plaque being removed, you see thrombus happening to, you know, you see kind of all these plaque morphologies. So the fact that you're kind of targeting just what you need to take out, usually you'll get less plaque out. <laughs> it is important to prevent um, mm -hmm. a poor outcomes and, and uh, disembolization by cleaning that out. Mm -hmm. Dr. Santana has a follow-up question. In renal patients with severe and extensive arterial wall calcification, I've found that this patient subset is very difficult and risky to work with. What is your experience with this device in that population? Well, again, you're talking about, again, I'm assuming deep wall calcium in that sense. So that's really going to be medial calcification. Um, again, as long as you can pass the cutter on a dry run past that, uh, I think you do pretty good on that. Uh, the only problem I've ever had is when it's really intraluminal calcium and, and uh, truly the ones that are bad are the renal failure patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've done a few couple renal failure patients like that, tibials, but more so above. But um, if, it's, if it's medial calcification, I think this works well. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it almost gives you a um, <clears throat> uh, iron cast to go through almost, so to speak. And it's even harder to cut into the adventitia. Uh, so, uh, and you see the calcium very, very, uh, uh, easily in the media. You, you see that as a clear band in there. So. Yeah. And what we've learned, uh, over the past year, as you know, is we've kind of, uh, been mistaken in terms of the distribution of calcium. Cause we've always thought, you know, we see fluoroscopically, we see calcium and we kind of need to think that it's luminal calcium, but what we're seeing with OCT guidance is that most of this calcium is actually not luminal calcium. It's actually intraplaque calcium, deep wall calcium, as you mentioned, a Mockenberg calcium. And so that's you know, much easier to cut. And really, you're doing a, a, a greater service to the patient by being able to reach that deep wall calcium where it's you know, usually with orbital atherectomy or rotational atherectomy, you're not really touching that calcium because what we're seeing is most of that calcium is intraplaque or deep wall calcium and not luminal calcium as we previously thought. And I think on the deep wall calcium, the, the medial wall calcium, you see it better with OCT <clears throat> because really on, on, on IVUS imaging, when you run into a calcified, you know, calcium inside the lumen, you get that dark blackout beyond the white wall there. If it's media, it's so it's almost like a speckled, so you don't you don't have that blackout on on the other side of the uh, calcium. If it's medial, if you notice it on IVUS, um, so I think you do see the uh, medial wall calcium better on OCT than you do IVUS. Um, Dr. Tedder asks, do you uh, frequently try to do this as a, a standalone atherectomy, or do you try to perform subsequent angioplasty? Um, and what do you think about the restenosis rates with, with or without angioplasty? Well, again, <clears throat> I probably do 30% uh, without angioplasty after it, I'd say. 70% uh, I do. Um, again, SFA popliteal is probably more common, more frequent, uh, just because it's hard to get that whole uh, vessel. And as you go down there, as you see this, you almost see like these linear areas of uh, – you, you want to call them hanging chads. We used to call them when we looked at IVUS. You still see these areas uh, that, that are ultimately end up being difficult to cut out uh, because they're moving as you're cutting down there. So I think those need to be ballooned at a low pressure. Um, and I think that helps. And again, uh, in theory, if you're trying to not disrupt the adventitia, if you're only putting in two atmospheres of pressure in a balloon versus six, eight, ten, um, you're going to have a lot less disruption or, or uh, disruption of the intima at that point. Er, yeah. And a uh, question came in, what is the role for distal protection for this device? Um, <clears throat> I think every device has the potential for distal embolization. Uh, technique really does play a role in it. Um, certainly too long of a cut before packing, I think can do it. Uh, if you overpack, it can do it. Um, I think why well, use some form of distal protection on almost everybody, uh, where I, I didn't used to, but I'm a firm believer of it now. So I have a different way of doing it. Typically I, I usually do a, uh, distal cuff, uh, 
um, occlusion. And uh, so I occlude the flow so nothing can go distally where I'm at. And then uh, I will aspirate. And that's, that's how I manage my uh, distal embolization more so than putting a filter down there. It's my uh, poor man's filter. Uh, Dr. Fishbein asked, uh, uh, or stated that uh, I've actually found an amazing amount of plaque yield per pass with SV as compared to the A400, which is the, uh, the SFA device, the uh, seven French device. I haven't done something as long as this case, but I'll do two to three passes in more proximal disease. Mm -hmm. Well, I would think, so. I think it does. Um, you probably need more effective packing with this, and that may be why. I'm not sure, but uh, um, that, that may be the aspect of it. Yeah, this device uh, is actually uh, the inner inner lumen of the nose cone is coated with a hydrophilic coating. Um, so that also allows for more efficient packing as well. And that's going to be coming on our workforce device in the future as well. And uh, then we have a question from Andy. Do you typically cut the plaque length equal to the length of the packing nose cone? Yes. To answer the question, yes. That's about it. Yeah. Excellent. I think those are, you know, awesome questions. Great comments. Thank you for uh, so much for everybody's engagement um, in this uh, in this webinar. Could you go to the next slide, please? So we're super excited about um, all the great responses that we've gotten and, and the enthusiasm that we uh, received for this webinar. Uh, we want to kind of tantalize you with what's upcoming. So we're going to be continuing this over the next few months. And these are some of the uh, topics that we're going to be covering, treating uh, multi-vessel disease. So you saw an excellent presentation by Dr. Tom Davis about treating uh, isolated below the knee disease and, and uh, the safety and efficacy of the technology. We will be talking about multi-level disease in the popliteal artery and below the knee. Um, and I'm going to do a talk on really understanding uh, OCT imaging and interpretation of what you're actually looking at, as, as Tom said, kind of 101 is sort of like learning the EEL, learning the media, and that's it. But as you get better and better with it, you start looking around, you're like, oh, here's a little necrotic core, here's some calcium, here's, you know, some Mockenberg calcium. So we'll kind of go through that and, and talk about what are the different things that you can see and, and evaluate with OCT. And we'll uh, have a webinar on OCT-guided CTO crossing, image-guided treatment of SFA, um, and, and really how to tips and tricks and how to optimize your outcomes with SFA treatment uh, um, with OCT guided directional atherectomy. And if you guys have any other thoughts, any other suggestions for topics, please email us at contact at avenger.com. I want to give a huge thanks and a shout out to Tom Davis for doing a phenomenal job, taking some awesome questions and really appreciate you being involved here today and really want to thank all the participants and um, for all their engagement and questions and their attention today. Hopefully this was very helpful. Thank you very much and you guys stay safe and be happy. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, you know what I'd also say, you got the contact Avenger, but uh, um, you know, if anyone has any questions that, or any problems during uh, their case or, you know, thoughts, uh, you know, you can send out my contact information because I'm always, uh, always love hearing from people what they have done and what they do. That's very kind of you. Thank you, Tom. Look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully in person.